Thursday, the 20th of July, and um, talking with Dorothy Shaw. Dot Shaw. Dot Shaw. Uh-huh. And Miss Shaw, um, I'd like to hear any of your memories about the World War II era that you care to share with the community. Well, I have two distinct memories, and uh, I was, uh, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, and I remember Sunday, December 7th, <laughs> 1941, and I had been to a movie with a friend, and as we, when we came out of the movie, another friend came by and said, have you heard of it? You know, the Japanese uh, bombed Pearl Harbor. And it was really, you know, unexpected, of course, at that time. And uh, I, I don't think the full realization of what that meant came through to me at all <laughs> at that time. But, of course, then later on, there was all kinds of things that happened. And uh, then my other real vivid memory is of um, VJ Day. And <clears throat> I remember my uh, a friend of mine, uh, father, took, um, there were two girls, and we went into, uh, he said, I'll take you downtown, Cleveland. And uh, so we got in the car and, and went downtown Cleveland. And it was just jam-packed with people <laughs> walking in the streets and walking on the sidewalks and uh, uh, it was impossible to drive the car. <laughs> so we got out and walked. <laughs> and uh, those two are real distinct memories for me. But there were lots of things in between too like uh, rationing. And uh, oh, saving uh, lard. Um, for the war effort. And uh, well, the gas rationing, of course, changed our lives completely. How did it go there in Cleveland? rationing? I kind of have the feeling that it was uh, people grumbled about it, but they accepted it, that it was necessary. I think that the country was so much more united for the war effort at that time than, than they were after that. It wasn't the same with the Vietnam War, or the Korean War, or any of those, but um, I think the country was really unified behind the war effort. Rosie the Riveter, <laughs> and uh, mostly I remember the music of that era because I was uh, young enough that uh, I really enjoyed dancing in the big band era. And uh, of course Glenn Miller lost his life and he was a really a favorite of mine, I think, uh, and of many people. Where would you dance in Cleveland during? Where? During well, the um, we had, uh, our high school had sock hops every Friday night. And so we would, uh, and those were record dances where they would play the records of all the famous uh, band leaders. And, uh, oh, and then sometimes we'd have large, uh, dances 
the sororities would have big dances at hotels in, in downtown Cleveland. What sorority were you a member of? I was a, a member of, uh, of several of them. <laughs> you could do that. Uh-huh. QD. And I can't remember what that was. And uh, ETR. Who, who w was in those sororities along with you? Um, other girls. <laughs> and we, we would go through a pledge system type thing. And uh, Pledges didn't have much um, to say about anything. <laughs> they were told what they had to do. <laughs> and uh, oh, and then I remember uh, the USOs. And uh, a girlfriend and I would would go down to the Masonic Temple on certain nights, I guess. And uh, the servicemen would come, and we'd dance with them or talk with them and that kind of thing. Like kind of like a canteen. Oh, I remember the stars in the window uh, when a family would have a, a, a son in the service and they would have, um, I think it was a blue star in the window. And then if, uh, when something happened to that individual, it would changed to a gold star. And it was always sad to see the gold stars in the window, knowing that there was a loss for that family. And then, th this covered a long period of time, but uh, my husband what was a prisoner of war in Germany and he escaped and uh, that was quite a an adventure for him I don't think he ever got over it But he was a prisoner of war for about, oh, eight or nine months, I think. And he escaped uh, when they were out on a march. And he found out later that they, the group that he was on the march with had all been put into a barn, and the barn had been set on fire. So he escaped that, too. <laughs> He was a ball turret gunner on a B-17. Did he tell you anything about the prison camp? Yes. Uh, I didn't meet him until after he came back. <clears throat> but uh, he was—he talked talked 
to me about the uh, privation of a prisoner of war and the fact that they didn't have much to eat and they uh, some of the psychological things that uh, that the guards would talk about for instance when Glenn Miller went down and they said you know, I think they kind of enjoyed it <laughs> <laughs> that uh, that famous band leader was no longer available. But I, I think uh, he didn't have it as difficult, I don't think, as uh, Oh, as others. And my brother was uh, in the uh, the Pacific. And I can remember he sent me a photograph one time and the eyes of, of these men look so haunted. What else could I tell you about? How did you and your husband meet? Um, I was in college and uh, my sorority sister in college said that, oh, you've got to meet my brother. And uh, so, and he was coming home. And so, uh, she she lived in Findlay, Ohio, which wasn't very far from the college we were attending. And uh, we went over to Findlay, and I was sitting on a, a stool in the in this ice cream parlor. <laughs> And he came in and uh, said, hi. <laughs> and I thought, gee, he's cute. Here with that up there. Nineteen forty-five, I think. And you were in college where? At Bowling Green, Ohio. <laughs> <coughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Did you start right after VJ Day or uh, Earlier. <coughs> I can't remember exactly. VJ Day was in August of... 45? August of 45. Uh -huh. Well, I graduated from high school in 44. And so I went to college that next fall. And was, uh, I'm having trouble with my dates. Was VJ Day in 44? I believe it was 45 in August. Well, that must have been when I was home for the summer then. Home in Cleveland? In Cleveland. In fact, I, I went to Bowling Green for a year and then um, 
I didn't have the money to go back to school in the fall. <coughs> so I worked for a, a department store. Which one? Higby's. In Cleveland? In Cleveland, Ohio. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then I, I quit and went back to school in the, the second term. At Bowling Green? At Bowling Green. Mm -hmm. And so I had a year and a half uh, of college in before I, w I was married in 46. And my mother said that, well, Dot, now don't get married until, at least until you're 20. And I was 20 on Friday, and I was married on Saturday. <laughs> Um, do you remember um, what it felt like to be in high school with a great war raging? I think at that time it wasn't all that real to me. Uh, in the, my class a lot of those boys were still a little bit too young to be in the service, although some of them did quit high school and go into the service. And uh, some of them lost their lives, too. But I, re I really don't think uh, well the war was so encompassing <laughs> it, it did take up I mean you didn't do anything uh, without concern of being concerned about the war And the gas rationing, of course, made a difference. If you just didn't get in the car and go someplace <laughs> without thinking about it. <laughs> How much gasoline were you limited to? I can't remember. I That's really right. did it. Did you mind? No. Not at that time, because I, I, I was so used to walking. And uh, I lived close enough that I could walk to high school and that kind of thing. Wore middies. It was our uniform that we had to wear. It, it was a it was a public high school, but uh, they thought that perhaps it was better since there were there was quite a range of income of the of the students that uh, it was much better if everybody wore the same kind of thing. So we had middies with sailor collars that we starched. <laughs> and then you had to have, get an excuse if, if you didn't have to have a midi to wear on a certain day. So you had to go to the office with an excuse and say, well, there just wasn't a clean one or whatever. <laughs> Those were good days. What were your parents doing while, while you were growing up in those years? My father was a, a lineman for a utility company, an electric company in Cleveland. And my mother was, uh, I think at that time, 
during that time she got a job and worked in an office. Did you miss her during those times of the day when she was at work? Were you at school all that time? Mm hmm It was, it was different having her work, but uh, we adjusted, <laughs> my brother and I. Well, actually, he was already in the service, and I think that was one reason why she decided she had to get out and away from the house so she wouldn't be thinking about him all the time and worrying. What would you do after school? Sometimes go to a, a local um, ice cream parlor or something, and have, or a soda fountain, and have a Coke uh, or an ice cream cone, and talk to a few friends. Sometimes, uh, oh. I stayed overnight at some somebody's house, and uh, I had just a few really good friends, I think. Do you remember? <clears throat> do you remember um, uh, hearing the president on the radio, or do you remember things about the radio, or or? Oh, I remember the, the speech that uh, FDR gave uh, about the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the day that will live in infamy. <laughs> And, uh, oh, when he, I think that was the period when FDR had his fireside chats, too, on the radio. And we would always listen to those. Should I break for water? Yes. <laughs> You're on. I'm feeling the same way. Um, it's going. Well, I, I enjoy hearing about um, your time from high school to marriage in, in Cleveland. Um, and I'm really hoping you uh, can tell me some more of what it felt like to be growing up during World War II. Well, what, the one thing that I, I really remember is this, the war just took over everybody's, uh, what? Well, it was just, it was all encompassing. And uh, everything turned around for the war effort. Uh, there was, 
I don't think there was a single household that was not affected by it. In some way, uh, well, I mentioned the rationing. Because everything was rationed. Shoes, butter, <laughs> uh, gasoline, tires. You just didn't. You, you had ration coupons that you had to uh, to get new shoes or anything like that. And, uh, and then I think that was a time when women went to work and that changed everybody's <laughs> uh, perceptions of the world and that was not bad to do either because uh, once the women started working I don't think they a lot of them did not want to go back to just being a housewife again and it created a lot of tension in a lot of households Did that happen to people you knew in, in Cleveland? Yes, some. Uh, in fact, I don't think my dad really liked the idea of my mother working. And it created some friction in our family. And it meant that he had to take over a little bit more responsibility of doing some things in the, in the house. And that his shirts weren't always laundered in the drawer, that kind of thing. And of course he didn't like that. <laughs> What was the most difficult thing about those years? I think I, I would say that uh, The sadness when you heard of somebody dying, I think that was really hard to take. Because it happened to so many young boys who went to service. And I remember the shock of, of hearing that uh, one of them wasn't going to be coming back. It made me feel really sad. And then, too, growing up in the war era, you got used to inconvenience, I think, of, uh, well, not enough 
sugar or um, butter. Oh, and that was when they came out with margarine. <laughs> and you had to color your own margarine sometimes. <laughs> What would you use to color margarine? Uh, you would get uh, this margarine in the store and it would be white, but they would also have a little capsule in there but, but included in the package. And you'd mix it all together <laughs> and make it yellow because that's what it was supposed to be. <laughs> I don't know why it couldn't have been white, <laughs> but it wasn't what people were used to. Where would you shop for food in Cleveland? At that time, there were. Uh, Mostly it was a neighborhood stores. My mother had a favorite butcher and baker and that kind of thing that she patronized. And I remember her sending me to the store with a quarter to buy a pound of Hamburg. <laughs> But I think that was a little bit early. <laughs> Do you remember hearing of battles during those years? Battle of the Bulge, definitely. It was a big one. And I know one of the, the young boys that I knew died in that battle. And uh, Dunkirk. And of course the landing in Normandy. And two. Uh, we, in, later on in the 60s, we went to England and stayed in this uh, town of Pinner, which was very close to London, and that was where President Eisenhower had his, had, had his headquarters. We had a detached cottage <laughs> in Pinner. <laughs> oh, and I remember too that uh, this was some time later, but uh, my husband was stationed in, in England. And uh, we went back to his old air base, and there was some cracked concrete there. That was it. <laughs> and I don't know, somebody well, well, when Bud was trying to find out about the airfield, and uh, it was close to I, the village of I, and uh, he asked some people, and they said, "Oh, that's a mushroom factory now." <laughs> anything left. <laughs> 
Do you remember anything else about returning with your husband? Well, you see, he he was uh, he was shot down on his second mission, and uh, oh, he had a very good friend who visited him at his air base. Uh, But then, uh, after he was shot down, his friend came and found out that he didn't come back from a mission. It's, I think it's difficult to talk about that, those times. Why do you think that is? I think when I think about the war years, it makes me feel very sad. Of all the death and dying that went on. And the realization that countries that used to be our enemies are now our friends, that kind of thing, <laughs> and that nothing is really constant. <laughs> Would you like some more water? No, thank you. Then I'll take advantage. Okay. <clears throat> Was there anything that you were especially afraid of during that time? I can't think of anything that stands out in my mind. Because we were removed. I mean, being in the United States, um, we weren't under attack or bombing and that kind of thing that, that they had in England or France. In Cleveland, were there air raids or sirens or alerts? I don't remember that there were, um, I, but I remember uh, bomb shelters. Mm -hmm. What did they look like? I can think of a cement block, rooms, <laughs> where you would store some canned goods and that kind of thing. I've lived a long time. <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> yes, I think it is too. It beats the alternative. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I don't know anyone these days who's got anything like a bomb shelter. But I remember from the late 60s the symbol for the fallout shelters of yes. the Cold War. Yes, uh-huh. Um, but there is a whole set of of things and of graphics and of the culture that I associate with World War II and that era. 
And it's interesting to hear you talk about them. Well, now, President Truman was the one that decided uh, to drop the atomic bomb. Was that at the end of the war? Oh, and then the, I remember the controversy about the, the Japanese being <laughs> put into camps in this country that, uh, that they were restricted in terms of their movements on the, on the West Coast. which didn't seem right somehow. <laughs> Did you know any Japanese in Cleveland? No, I didn't. Or um, Germans or Italian Americans? There was one uh, boy who was uh, Peter somebody who uh, came over from Germany. And it was strange to hear him talk, to speak. I hadn't thought about him for a long time. Was he about your age? Mm-hmm. He was in a lot of my classes. And he was different. <laughs> Peter Rosenfeld or something like that. And the sadness of what happened to all the, the Jews in Germany. It's unspeakable. Uh, and I, I know my husband would have talked about, he, he for a long time, he had trouble speaking with German people because of that association that whenever he heard German spoke, he associated it with the prison camp that he was in. At one time I was in uh, I was in Italy and my purse was stolen and I went to the police station and this Italian policeman, it was like he was writing a, a thesis or something <laughs> and that there, were, there was a, a German couple who had had some mishap, some, their car had been broken into or something. And they were from Stuttgart. And I said, oh. And they said, oh, do you know Stuttgart? And I didn't really have the heart to say, well, yeah, my, my husband bombed Stuttgart <laughs> during the war. Do you remember how you first heard of the war? Well, that, that Sunday, uh, when this friend and I had gone to a movie, and coming out of the movie, 
and uh, another friend came up and said, have you heard what happened? And the full realization of it, though, it was a long a process that went on for a long time after that, what, what the meaning of all that was. I don't think we had any idea of how it was going to affect all portions of our lives at that time. I don't know what else I can tell you about it. You're doing fine. <laughs> You're doing fine. Um, as I say, it's just as interesting to hear about growing up and, mm -hmm. and being at home during wartime. If you could sum that period of your life, of that, that war era, up in a handful of words, do you know how you sum that up? It seemed as though there was, it was a very exciting time. There was something always happening, sometimes very good things and sometimes very bad things. What was it like to grow up in that era? I don't think we had, I didn't have a, a feeling of deprivation because it was happening to everybody. <laughs> I didn't feel singled out. And everything was blamed on the war. Is there some section of that you would live over again if you if you could? Are you glad it's gone? Glad it's over with? I'm glad it's it's gone. I don't think I have the energy <laughs> to go through it all again. No way. <laughs> and my my son was in the Vietnam War and. Uh, we were living in Wisconsin at the time, and we lived, were living in an apartment, and he was in the Marines, and uh, there was a knock on the door, and I went to the door with a smile on my face, and there was this Marine sergeant <laughs> standing there. Mrs. Shaw? Yes. <laughs> And he, he said that he just wanted to let, uh, let me know that Scott had uh, been transferred to uh, a, ho a hospital because he had malaria. <laughs> he said, thank you, <laughs> with a smile still on my face. <laughs> and uh, wars are hell. And it keeps happening, generation after generation. We'll, I don't know whether we'll ever learn. <laughs> Were there heroes 
he had from that time era were villains. Well, Audie Murphy certainly was a hero, I think, wasn't he? And uh, I think I, I think more in terms of heroes than villains. And the propaganda. And I don't think that the United States was all that pure at that time either. But we always felt that right was on our side. But lots of things have been done in the name of right that were really pretty gruesome, like, like the Crusades and that kind of thing. Did you go to the movies? Oh, lots. You have some memories? Uh, I, I think we, we went to the movies constantly, to this little neighborhood movie theater. I think it cost 35 cents, <laughs> which is very different than $4 or $5 now. Six or seven. <laughs> or six or seven, yes. <laughs> and on Saturdays, uh, we could go to the local movie theater and get in for the matinee for 10 or 15 cents, I think. And the movies were either very patriotic themes or real homespun. And they almost have nothing to do with what is going on today. <laughs> I guess it was a good time, really, to be growing up. Did you have favorite movies or, or radio programs or records or dances? Oh, I remember In the Mood uh, in Pennsylvania 65,000. Could you have a few bars? Oh. I'm not sure that I could. <laughs> Hoagie Carmichael, Stardust, was a favorite. Their entertainers, your parents liked more than than you and your brother. <coughs> oh, we always used to listen to Fibber McGee and Molly. The whole family would would listen to that on the radio. And Jack Benny it was a favorite too. Um, I'm having trouble with the movies in terms of putting them in to 
that particular time slot. <laughs> Doris Day was later. But she may have had some out of the time. I know Dinah Shore did. Yes, Dinah Shore. And Catherine Hepburn was tremendous. Fred McMurray, and I think Humphrey Bogart. <laughs> there, there was a real a, a, a Humphrey Bogart fan club for a while. <laughs> Did you have dates during those years? Mm-hmm. There was a boy in my class that uh, we were, quote, going steady. My brother was oh, about two, maybe two and a half years older than I. And uh, we were, well, he was a Malay, which is uh, connected with the Masons. And I was a rainbow girl which was also connected with the Eastern Stars and the Masons. And uh, my friend and I would go down to the Masonic Temple, and that was where the Rainbow Girls had their meetings. And I was president of the choir. But they said, Doc, just don't sing. Because <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't hear you too. Bring the vegetable man will be out front in about 20 minutes. We will have food, corn, do you need any of those? We'll, no. we'll wind up in a, in a few minutes. Okay. I'm really enjoying it though. Um, Once again, the vegetable man will be out front in about 20 minutes. He said he has food, corn, tomatoes, okra, and beans. Thank you. What do you remember eating during those years? Meatloaf. My mother made the best meatloaf. <laughs> and uh, pot roast, too. Occasionally we would have pot roast. When we had and we could save up enough of our ration stamps to, to have meat. <laughs> oh, and uh, for Thanksgiving and Christmas, my mother would make Plum pudding. That was quite a 
an involved process. And you have to go to the, the butcher and get real dry suet to use in, in the plum pudding. And they would we'd put them in a crock and it'd have to ferment over a long period of time. Delicious. <laughs> Do you remember other holidays during World War II? Did you get any vacation of any kind? Yes, we, we have uh, maybe a week at Christmas time. And then we'd have all summer off, too. And I started work in a department store down in downtown Cleveland when I was I think. Just on a part-time basis. Um, when the store would be open on Monday nights or all day Saturdays, I would work. That was Hallie Brothers, where I started doing that. It was a very exclusive department store in Cleveland. I don't know whether it's still in operation or not. I can find out. Good. <laughs> I've got family there too. Okay. Yeah, I would like to know. <laughs> Do you remember anything about the weather during World War II? Is there anything unusual about the winter in Cleveland? It's cold. Uh, not much snow. Mostly Cleveland in the winter time is gray. And uh, of course, right along the lake, and my dad used to call it a one horse town. Tell me about going off to college. Well, at that time, I was really interested in art school. But my father said, okay, but how are you going to earn a living? <laughs> and so I went to Bowling Green and took business courses. And. Uh, I remember I had a
skirt, a, a plaid skirt, and uh, this wonderful green blazer that I took to Bowling Green with me that I was real proud of. Why did you pick Bowling Green? Because it was a state school and um, it wasn't as expensive as other places. And actually I was the only one in my family to even go to college. And I was the only one who ended up getting a degree. <laughs> but education was always really important to me. And it, Bowling Green was close enough to Cleveland, too, that I could get in on a train at that time and go to Cleveland, uh, or um, somebody would come and get me and I, we would go. It wasn't far away from Cleveland. And uh, then I think I had a friend who went there, and that kind of helped, too. <laughs> You'd take the train, then? from Cleveland to Bowling Green. You know, trains have kind of, for the most part, gone out of stuff. Disappeared, yeah. yes. In fact, <clears throat> uh, I was trying to think. I know I could get in on the train in Cleveland and Bowling Green. But I don't, I, my sister-in-law still lives in, in Cleveland, and uh, she said no, that she didn't think that that was, was operating anymore. So, oh, and I remember traveling on the train with all the servicemen. And of course, they had priority. You could get bumped off. <laughs> Did they like to see a teenage girl? Did any of them make passes at you while you were growing up? Oh, yes, yeah, some. But I had been warned ahead of time. <laughs> Don't listen. <laughs> Do you remember how that warning would go? What your your mom and dad would tell you about the world out there? I think, uh, my mother talked to me much more than my dad. Uh, she said, Stop. You know, don't do that. <laughs> it's not nice. It was a different world back then.
there was a, a sense of values, I think. And the world wasn't as complex as it is now. I don't think uh, young people growing up had all the choices that they do have now. And I think it's much more confusing now for young people growing up. choices. And there doesn't seem to be a real sense of what's right and wrong. But I try and stay flexible. <laughs> Do you remember any particular characters? Cartoons? Well, I just met people or save that for another time. Yes. <laughs> um, I'll wind up in a moment. You said a sense of what's right and wrong was very characteristic. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate for just a moment on what you perceived as being what was right and what was wrong during the era you grew up? during the World War II era? Well, I think honesty was definitely something that was uh, talked about in my family. How important it was to be honest and, and trustworthy. Those were good things. Bad things were girls getting pregnant, <laughs> which happened to some members of my high school class. But it wasn't something that was talked about at that time. But you always knew who the bad girls were. <laughs> Sense of decorum. And I'm not sure I even know what I mean by that. Which in essence is like right or wrong. Kinda. Mm hmm How did I know what was right and wrong? I, I think it was just um, something that was ingrained in me through all the years I was growing up.
And of course, I wanted to be a nice girl. <laughs> Didn't want to cause any trouble. <laughs> Now I'm telling you all my secrets. <laughs> no, I, I think I enjoy being liked. I think anybody does. I don't know. living here in a retirement home, I think it's much easier to smile at people than to frown and whine and complain. Can you tell me what brought you to Athens? Originally, <laughs> my uh, husband was with the university, and so we, that's why we came. And I've enjoyed Athens very much. Love the climate and uh, the physical climate and the intellectual climate too. Is there anything you'd like to add before we wind up for now? You can always add something later, but to finish up our interview. No, I don't think so. I've enjoyed it. Spotlight on. <laughs> well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Dr. Shull? Shull? Shull. Would you tell me where the name comes from? Was that your husband's name? Yes. Mm -hmm. And it was originally um, Von Schul. And I think there were three or four brothers that came over from Germany a long, long time ago. And uh, it became Americanized, the name, and uh, I think maybe that's where my ideas about education came from, because my, my husband's mother and father were both educators and uh, see, 17 and a half years to get my bachelor's degree. <laughs> I persisted though. <laughs> 17 and a half years in five different universities before I finally got it. <laughs> I think that I'm as proud of that as uh, anything. What was your degree in? Business. <laughs> Management. From which of those five colleges? Uh, well, I ended up graduating from uh, Indiana University. And my, my husband taught in the management department. And, but always I had, uh, I kept up my interest in art work and that kind of thing. And I always sketched quite a bit and, and I painted a little bit and that kind of thing. But now I'm, I'm much interested in writing, 
as well as, as painting and sketching. And I would like to focus on writing some children's books. Ms. Schull, before I turn this off, what was your maiden name? My maiden name was Sidaway, which is a very English name. And my grandfather and grandmother on my father's side came over from England. And my mother's mother came over from England. So I guess you would say I'm primarily English. And would you spell it over one? S-I-D-D-A-W-A-Y. And some people have dropped the the second D. Well, thank you one, once again for interview, being interviewed.